Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please join me in welcoming Deacon Cordia Baptist. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to set us free, and that in him we see the fullness of your loving plan for the whole human race and the image and design of who we are called to become as we cooperate with grace. Lord, you have called us as members of his body to proclaim the message of true freedom and true liberation to a world that is waiting to be born. Be with us this evening as we break open the truth and rediscover as Christians the connection between freedom and truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. My topic is freedom and independence, understanding the authentic notion of Christian liberty, which in the title itself implies there is an inauthentic notion, and there is a counterfeit understanding of freedom and liberty. There clearly is a struggle underway over the meaning of the very word freedom, the meaning of the word liberty, and they're often interchanged. And as Catholic Christians, we affirm that freedom has a specific end, a telos, to which it must be directed, if it is to be true and authentic freedom. And when it is directed that way, it will lead us to human flourishing and to happiness there is, as theologians say, a constitutive connection between freedom and truth. And when freedom is properly understood, it becomes a lens through which we view our life differently and live our life differently. And it directs how we relate to others and how we live in the social and cultural order. Freedom has consequences. Our choices have the capacity to not only change the world around us, but to change us. In fact, they make us the kind of persons we become. And the very capacity to make good choices is what makes us truly and fully human and sets us free. What we choose then either humanizes us or leads us into slavery. That's what the apostle was saying to the Christians in Galatia. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Do not submit yourself again to the yoke of slavery. This capacity for freedom, this capacity to choose, reflects the Imago Dei, the image of God within each one of us. And as the fathers of the Second Vatican Council said in their wonderful document on the mission of the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, authentic freedom is an outstanding manifestation of the divine image within man. Now, this kind of authentic freedom is the antidote to what Pope Emeritus Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism. It insists that there is such a thing as truth and that truth can be known, yes, through the exercise of reason, but it finds its fullness in the manifestation in the one who is himself the way, the truth, and the life. God wants us free. He wants us happy. We don't say that enough to people. God wants us happy. When I was a little boy growing up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and you can still tell the accent, <laughs> uh, I remember the, quote, old catechism, huh? Who made you? God made you. Why did God make you? To know, love, and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. And that, of course, is still true. But I don't think it emphasized another aspect. Happiness begins now, if we understand what happiness really is. The call to beatitude. And that word can be translated happiness. 
Only in choosing what is good and what is true and what is beautiful will lead us to happiness, to human flourishing, to becoming fully alive. And as Irenaeus of Lyon reminds us, that is God's glory. There's a counterfeit notion of freedom in our day, and it is leading men and women to slavery. What Paul referred to as the slavery of sin. In June of 2005, Pope Emeritus Benedict addressed an assembly of families, and he coined a very unique phrase that gets to the heart of this counterfeit notion of freedom. He said, today's various forms of dissolution of marriage and free unions and trial marriages, as well as the pseudo-matrimonies between people of the same sex, are instead expressions of anarchic freedom which falsely tries to pass itself off as the true liberation of man. Benedict was affirming what Paul proclaimed. There's a false notion of freedom, and it leads to anarchy, to wandering, to aimlessness. Now, St. John Paul regularly engaged this topic in his wonderful, wonderful magisterium. He referred to a counterfeit notion of freedom. And in the Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae, he warned of the death of true freedom. He presented the authentic Christian vision of freedom from the moment he stepped out on that platform as a successor of Peter. And he demonstrated it in the way he lived his life. In his first letter, his first encyclical letter, The Redeemer of Man, and you'll notice I don't use the Latin, and that's intentional. I certainly understand it and respect it. But particularly in my work ecumenically, I've found over the years that it really isn't very helpful. If I say, you know, Evangelium Vitae, or if I say in the Gospel of Life, or if I say in Familiarius Consortio, instead of Christian family in the modern world. So I'm not opposed to using a Latin title, but you'll notice I use the English ones throughout my presentation. This was his first letter called The Redeemer of Man. And listen to this. John Paul wrote, since man's true freedom is not found in everything that the various systems and individuals see and propagate as freedom, the church, because of her divine mission, becomes all the more the guardian of freedom. What a beautiful phrase. The church is the guardian of freedom. Now in an age that thinks the church is taking away freedom, we need to tell the truth. She guards it. And she can lead all men and women to true freedom. And then we need to take our place as members of the church, members of the body of Jesus Christ, and become freedom fighters, proclaiming freedom to the captives. Freedom, John Paul wrote, is the condition and basis for the human person's true dignity. Jesus Christ meets the man of every age, including our own, with the same words, and you recognize these. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. These words contain both a fundamental requirement and a warning. The requirement, an honest relationship with regard to truth, as a condition for authentic freedom. And the warning, to avoid every kind of illusory freedom, every superficial unilateral freedom, every freedom that fails to enter into the whole truth about man and the world. Our challenge in this new missionary age, and that is what we are in, my friends, a new missionary age, is to proclaim the truth that sets men and women free. And we've had some great examples in the leadership of the church. John Paul, Benedict, Francis, but we must become examples in our own lives. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, and you recognize that name, He's now Pope Emeritus Benedict, our monk in the Vatican, praying every day for the church. What a wonderful prophetic vocation. Uh, in his seminal book on 
called Introduction to Christianity, which is really a, not a very good title because it's a very deep and profound book. It sounds like it's a kind of an introduction to Christianity. It's, it's a beautiful presentation of the depth of Christianity. And he wrote in that book, one could very well describe Christianity as a philosophy of freedom. How contrary to what people think, huh? Philosophy deals with the existential questions that men and women ask. And they all ask them. They're being asked in our day and age. And that is an open door for sharing the truth of the gospel. Look, in the last couple of weeks, what has happened in the world? It's frightening people. It's shaking their sense of security and opening them to the message of the gospel, which is the only real path to authentic security and freedom. Christianity truly is a philosophy of freedom because all men and women were created out of love, in love, and for love by the God who is love. And they will only be fully human and alive when they respond to his invitation, when they say yes. That's the message of the gospel. And that's where they'll find freedom. There's a lot of counterfeit freedom around. Benedict also, in 2005, in addressing examples of counterfeit freedom and choice, legalized abortion on demand, euthanasia, said this, the freedom to kill is not true freedom. It is a tyranny that reduces the human being to slavery. And we've seen that. By calling what is wrong a right, contemporary men and women are becoming bound by the chains of their own delusion and imprisoned by anarchic freedom. And there's a heaviness in people's lives, the kind of heaviness that comes from being enslaved to disordered passions and the wrong choices. That anarchic freedom is not only a counterfeit, but an enemy which we must confront, expose, and then in its place, propose the gospel. Now the catechism of the Catholic Church, and I had you turn to the Bible. I asked Deacon Sabatino if you all brought your catechisms. He said, uh, I don't think so. I want to suggest that every Catholic, every Catholic, be they Eastern or Western, every Catholic, needs to not only have this book, and by the way, I have the big one, for obvious reasons. When I turned 50, I started having to use reading glasses. And the little one is so tiny, it's hard for me to read. But there's another reason. There's a glossary in the big one. And the glossary is a very helpful tool. This catechism is such a treasure. And I tell people in my catechetical work, you can approach it in all kinds of ways. You can swim like an ant in a puddle, or you can dive in like an elephant in the ocean. You can approach it just to find the answers to the questions, and that's just fine. You can go to the glossary in the back. You can use it in the way it's set up, following the ancient creed, which, by the way, was the earliest approach to catechesis. Huh? Remember, we had catechisms before we even have the approved canon. We had the Jerusalem catechesis, and it followed the creed. But it's a wonderful book to dive into, out of prayer, and just begin to read. And when you look at the footnotes, to take the time to look up the scripture passages and to pray through them. Or once you use the tool in the beginning, which shows you what the abbreviations mean, to start looking up the citations to the early fathers, the citations to the Second Vatican Council, the citations to the encyclical letters and the apostolic exhortations. Now, let me stop here for a moment. Sometimes people hear me say these things and they say, we're not theologians. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Think about the early church. Many of the apostles had no formal theological training, huh? But look what happened to them because of their encounter with Jesus and the depth of their prayer and the intimacy of their Christian walk. Look what happened to John. Now, that's a theologian. 
wrote the fourth gospel, the most theological, and those beautiful letters in the back of the New Testament, was used to the Lord at a ripe old age to give us the revelation of the apocalypse. We need that kind of theology in this day and age. We need mystics, men and women of deep and living faith who pray and live a naturally supernatural life. The catechism is a great resource. And it's a great resource in our work with other Christians. One of the things I've found, and I've been working ecumenically for decades, is when discussions come up on distinctives of doctrine, and they're real, and we shouldn't pretend they're not. One of the things I'm able to say is, you know, if you want to understand what the Catholic Church teaches on that, there are two things that we can go to. The first and the most important, of course, is the good book, and they smile. The canon, the measuring stick. And then the second is this catechism. I want to tell you, over the years, I've found evangelical Protestant friends reading the catechism more than Catholics I know. And when they discover it, they're amazed. We need to discover it. And we need to allow it to form us and inform our way of life. The catechism says some amazing things about counterfeit notions of freedom and about the incredible power of freedom, both to choose what is good and what is true and what is noble and thus to be changed, or to choose what is bad and what happens. Paragraph 1861, we read these words. Mortal sin is a radical possibility of human freedom, as is love itself. Wow. Mortal sin is a radical possibility of human freedom. Freedom is not just about the fact that we can choose, but what we choose and who we become. Our choices not only change the world around us, they change us. Now, if you have your catechism, turn with me to Article 3. And in the big green book, it's on page 430. But it starts with paragraph 1730. And I'm going to read a few select passages out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on man's freedom. God created man a rational being, conferring on him the dignity of a person who can initiate and control his own actions. God willed that man should be left in the hand of his own counsel so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full and blessed perfection by cleaving to him. And then the catechism cites Irenaeus. Man is rational and therefore like God. He's created with free will and his master over his acts. Freedom is the power rooted in reason and will to act or not to act. To do this or that, and so to perform deliberate actions on one's own responsibility. By free will, one shapes one's own life. Human freedom is a force for growth and maturity in truth and goodness. It attains its perfection, and that term theologically means completion, when it's directed toward God, our beatitude. As long as freedom has not bound itself definitively to its ultimate good, which is God, there is the possibility of choosing between good and evil, and thus of growing in perfection or of failing in sinning. This freedom characterizes properly human acts. It's the basis of praise or blame, merit or reproach. The more one does what is good, the freer one becomes. What a line. Let's say that together. The more one does what is good, the freer one becomes. When we choose what is good, what is right, what is true, what is noble, what is beautiful, we grow in freedom. And we've been given the grace to do that. There is no true freedom except in the service of what is good and just. The choice to disobey and do evil is an abuse of freedom and leads to, quoting St. Paul, the slavery of sin. 
When we turn against God, we abuse our freedom. And we fashion our own chains. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. We live in an age which espouses a freedom of choice that amounts to the power to do whatever one wants. And we see what's happening as a result of it. In behavior that treats the human person as something and not someone, a gift to be received, that approach does not free us, fulfill us, or make us happy. Nor does it build a truly human and just social order. Catholic moral teaching, classical Christian teaching, and that's what Catholic moral teaching is, offers an enormous potential to engage our culture. A culture that claims to be pursuing self-fulfillment, but is making choices that are leading to emptiness and division and despair. And we have a lot of resources the church presents to us. Some of the ones I'm going to refer to this evening come from St. John Paul II. I have to disclose he is my champion and my hero. And I think for hundreds of years, we will be unpacking what he has offered. One of the things he offered is a masterful encyclical letter on the moral life. It's called Veritatis Splendor, or the Splendor of Truth. Again, I recommend you get a hold of it. Put it where you pray and read it slowly and let it sink in. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary gift. In that letter, he uses a wonderful quote from Gregory of Nyssa. It's actually used by the Fathers of the Second Vatican Council and it's in the Catechism. And let me read it. All things are subject to change and becoming never remains constant but continually passes from one state to another for better or for worse. Now, human life is always subject to change. It needs to be born ever new. But here, birth does not come about by a foreign intervention, as is the case with bodily beings. It's the result of free choice. Thus, we are, in a certain sense, our own parents, creating ourselves as we will by our decisions. Wow. We become our own parents, creating and recreating ourselves by our own decisions. The more one does what is good, the freer one becomes. And God in his goodness gives us every day to do it again, to wake up and choose him, and to ask for his grace to be able to overcome those things that impede us from making these choices. And we know what that is. Sin. Sin is an abuse of the freedom to choose given to us by God. That's what the Catechism says. And in a certain sense, what sin has done is fractured our freedom. Fractured our capacity to see clearly, to choose what is good and what is true and what is beautiful. And we cannot deal with that on our own. And God knew it. And so he sent his son to save us, to set us free and to begin the new creation. And through his son, he gives us everything we need to deal with this fractured freedom. Jesus continues his ministry through his church, which is his body. And through his church and through the sacraments, he continues to give us grace. And we can always begin again. This Splendor of Truth letter is an absolutely beautiful treatment of grace. What John Paul did was he responded to the call of the Second Vatican Council to once again ground moral theology in the sacred scripture. And he uses the story of the rich young man as a framework, a hermeneutic theologians say, within which to speak of the moral life. 
And we all know the story of that young man who went away sad. And he went away sad because he made the wrong choice. It wasn't because he had riches. Riches are goods of the human person. But it was because they had him. They had taken the place of idolatry in his life and impeded his capacity to choose God's love made fully manifest in front of him. And that's what made him sad. And that's what makes us sad. Mortal sin is a radical possibility of human freedom. And in the splendor of truth, John Paul reminds us, and the Catechism affirms, patterned on God's freedom, man's freedom is not negated by his obedience to the divine law. Indeed, only through this obedience does it abide in the truth and conform to human dignity. Man achieves this dignity when he frees himself from all subservience to his feelings and in a free choice of the good, pursues his own end by effectively and assiduously marshalling the appropriate means. Now this moral vision of the human life as a call to freedom and happiness and beatitude and participating in God's ongoing ministry through the church is rooted in the New Testament teaching. This connection between what we choose and who we become comes through over and over again as Jesus preaches in his earthly ministry. Let me give just two examples that we'll all be quite familiar with. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 28, Jesus tells us that we become adulterers when we look at a woman with lust. That's already a choice. He tells us, and we see it in Mark 7, that what comes out of our heart is what makes us unclean. Now the heart in the biblical sense and in the moral sense is not that fleshy organ in the center of our chest but the seat, the Catechism says, of our moral personality, the place where we make our choices. And that's what needs to be saved and transformed by grace. With the heart, man believes. Confess with your mouth, the apostle wrote, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. We need Jesus Christ to live in our heart. And when he does, our heart is conformed to his own heart, and we begin to change. Now, all of this has implications not only for our individual life, but our life together. Because not only are we created in the image of God insofar as we're called to exercise our freedom in imitation of his freedom, and that our freedom is patterned after his freedom, but we are by nature and grace called to give ourselves away to the other. We are social by nature and grace. We will never be fully human outside of relationship. And we see that, of course, in the beautiful creation accounts in the book of Genesis. But we see what happened when our first parents made the wrong choice. We see the fall. But even before that, in one of those accounts, we see Adam alone. And after God created all these wonderful things and said it was good, he said it was not good for man to be alone. Why? Because man is created in the image of God, and that image requires relationship. We are called to give ourselves away to the other. And therefore, our relationships with one another also need to conform to the moral constitution which we discern through the teaching of the church and the scriptures. We need to relate to one another in truth and in love, and that will set us free. That affects not only our relationships with one another in the church, but the church's relationship with the world. And this is critically important in this hour. The early Christians used to speak of the church as the new world, the world in the course of transfiguration. And the way they viewed the world 
was redemptive. They understood that Jesus continues his ministry, that God still loves the world so much that he sends his only son, and he does it through members of his body. We are called to go into the world and to continue the redemptive mission of Jesus. We need to live our lives in a way that not only changes us, draws us closer to one another with bands of love in the Christian community, but literally continues the presence of Jesus Christ in a world that desperately needs that presence. We need living faith. Another one of his letters, which I brought with me, Faith and Reason, Fides et Ratio, I also recommend you get a hold of and keep next to your prayer chair and let the Holy Spirit guide you. It's a rich and a wonderful letter. And in that letter, John Paul wrote, it is not just that freedom is a part of the act of faith, it is absolutely required. Indeed, it is faith that allows individuals to give consummate expression to their own freedom. Freedom is never realized in decisions made against God. For how could it be open to the very reality which enables our own self-realization? Men and women can accomplish no more important act in their lives than the act of faith, because it is here that freedom reaches the certainty of truth and chooses to live in that certainty. Now, we live in a Western culture that is imploding. We all see it. But this is our moment. I like to say when I'm speaking to large crowds of our evangelical Protestant friends, these may be difficult times, but these are our times. We were born and born again for these times. And we were. This is the age the Lord chose to place us in because we are his answer to that implosion. A lot of times people talk about the West as being postmodern. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of it. What I suggest is, and I say this to people all the time, we'd all be a lot better off if we pretended we just awakened this morning in this culture as Christians and then ask ourselves, what should we do? and then lived our life as missionaries. I suggest we begin to see this culture as pre-Christian. Oh, we can talk about it being neo-pagan and all of that, and I understand, and that's meritorious. But how about pre-Christian? And we're the missionaries. We're called to Christianize it. We're called to stand on the shoulders of the great men and women of 2,000 years who lived in cultures very much like this and transformed them from within by a vibrant way of life and a courageous willingness to live the gospel in a magnetic way that drew men and women to the truth. And we all know that's who the saints are. They're our older brothers and sisters in the faith and they put legs on the faith and they inspire us to live differently. Think about Patrick when he went to Ireland. Ireland was completely besieged by Druids. Now, we have our own Druids, I know, in the West. But nonetheless, how did Patrick approach them? He didn't have fear. He was a man of deep prayer and faith and a man of great wisdom. He had a pattern. He'd go to the chieftain, and he'd bring gifts, and he'd share the gospel. Didn't make a lot of progress but he knew he was showing respect, and the chieftain would then allow him to preach to the young and also give him property. And so he had a long-haul vision, and look what happened to Ireland. We have many, many, many other examples. Perhaps the best example are the first five centuries of the Christian church. I really think, in a certain sense, what we are facing in the West is very much like what the early primitive church faced as she went out into the Roman Empire. We're all familiar, and I know you're in particularly familiar, 
given the wonderful work of the Institute for Catholic Culture, with the ancient sources we have, like the letter to Diogenetus, which gives us the contextual milieu of how the early Christians dealt with cultures of death. What a wonderful letter, written by probably an anonymous Christian, although we think we know who he was, to an early pagan inquirer who was asking, how come Christians live this way? And the vision in that letter of our role in the culture should inspire us in this hour, if it is indeed a pre-Christian age. As the soul is to the body, so are Christians to the world. We're called to become the soul of this age. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to deal with what happened. What brought us to this point in the West? A way of knowing, which began to reduce things to matter, to be dissected into smallest parts. And it resulted in a disincarnating of men and women, of the cosmos, and a whole change in how we began to understand the process of knowing or epistemology. Confidence in the role of human reason, which was understood in the classical Christian vision as participating in God's loving plan, which was eminently reasonable as logos, and demonstrated in the West particularly by Thomas Aquinas, who just represented patristic thought. It began to erode. The metaphysics, which had been the strength of Western thought, began to collapse. Serious doubts about reason's proper role crept in, even into the church. And the old way was replaced by what was perceived as the new way. And we began to have teachers of that new way. And we know the results. Two towering figures emerged. Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, and Immanuel Kant and a new definition of reason and natural law replaced the old and morphed into something significantly different. And we still see the fruits, the bad fruits of all of this in the jurisprudence and the philosophy of the West. Bacon and Descartes and Newton and Locke became the pillars of a new order. And the sweep of modernism was wide. The impact was vast. We see some of it still in the influence in the American experiment. And we all know, as, as brilliant as the American founders were, and they were, and as noble as their experiment was, we see the seeds in Jefferson's high regard for Bacon and Locke and Descartes. And we see movements such as progressivism that came out of it. We see the emergence of this notion of the autonomous individual and the counterfeit notion of freedom I've been talking about. This idea that choice can be detached from what is good and what is true and what is noble and beautiful. And a whole notion of the human person, not even as an animal, but as a machine. And political movements began to grow up that affected and infected the West. We saw it in France, and we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in France and for those who have lost loved ones in this horrible, horrible evil that's been inflicted. But we also know what happened in the French Revolution. And as noble sentiments as liberty, equality, and fraternity are, how they were understood led to some terrible things, including the taking off of the heads of clerics and the persecution of the church. We saw the division of soul from body. And all of this led to a weakened Christianity. And then along with that, we begin to see the divisions in the body of Christ in the West. Remember, we had an undivided church for the first thousand years. But particularly now focusing on the Middle Ages in the West, the splintering that began to happen in the body of Christ with what's called the Protestant Reformation also weakened the church's capacity to affect and change the culture. And that's what we've inherited. That's our moment as well. Where are we now? 
The church is a counterculture. Now, she's been here before. In a sense, she always has been a counterculture. And I believe we are living in a new missionary age. This is not the first time in history that we have been here. We all know that. We know, for example, in the first few centuries, there was not only primitive forms of abortion, but infant exposure and all kinds of awful things. This is not the first culture of death we've found ourselves in. But we live here now, and we are called to change it. That is our mission, to bring the saving message of Jesus Christ into this moment. And to do that, we need to know him and to be formed with a Christian mind. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We need a reformation of our mind, and we need to re-examine how we view our own life. Where are there separations in our life? First, how do we view ourselves as human persons? Do we believe what the church teaches and what the scriptures proclaim and what Jesus, the new man, shows us? That by grace, body, soul, and spirit are an integrated human person. Sin separated, grace reunites. How do we see our body? How do we deal with our passions? How are we allowing grace to transform us as human persons? I don't have time, but passions and emotions are not bad. It's when they're disordered, they lead us astray. Are they being reordered? How do we view our life in the family? Do we really understand what the church teaches and what the scriptures are clear about? That the Christian family is a domestic church. And then in a very real sense, those who live the vocation of consecrated marriage and family life live in the church and never leave it. Do we really see our families that way? How do we view our relationship to the social order? Do we see what social teaching calls us to see and to live? The social teaching of the Catholic Church is a tremendous treasure. Now I know for many, many years it was co-opted on the left and on the right, but it needs to be taken right now and used as the leaven to transform the West. Again, every Catholic home, along with a catechism, should have the compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Now it's been out since the early 90s, but few Catholic homes have it. The great thing about this compendium is no longer do we have to go to this encyclical or that encyclical or this encyclical or rely on this expert or that expert. If you want to know what the social teaching of the Catholic Church really is, it's in this book. And it's organized in a wonderful way. And it offers us principles for our work in the culture. Do we see that we're called to work in the culture? Do we understand it? How do we approach the economy. The church offers us principles. She doesn't offer an economic theory, but she offers us principles. How do we approach business? Are we living a compartmentalized life or an integrated Christian life? In Lumen Gentium, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council warned about what they called the separation between faith and life. They said it was among the greatest error of our age. Is it an error that we fall prey to? How do we view our political participation? Do we understand that we are called into the political arena? Of course, we know that politics will never save the world. But nonetheless, we are citizens. And we believe that there is a natural moral law. There's a moral foundation to freedom. How do we approach business and economics? These are important questions. And of course, one of the greatest challenges we face is confusion over conscience. We all know that in this day and age in particular, people speak of conscience as though it equates with feelings or my own personal opinion. 
when in truth we are called to educate our conscience, to form our conscience. All of this leads, and I'm going to have to bring it to an end, to how we understand independence. Our exercise of freedom implies a reference to a natural moral law of universal character that precedes and unites all rights and duties. That's out of the compendium. That natural law is nothing other than the light of intellect infused within us by God. And that natural moral law is for the whole human race. Do we understand that? Do we believe it? Does it affect how we approach our citizenship? Now, I'm going to conclude by giving you some examples from my own career. I've been a lawyer for 35 years. And much of that time, I've been dealing with religious liberty and pro-life and pro-family work. And one of the things that I think is the greatest gift that Catholic thinking brings into the arena of jurisprudence and politics is this natural moral law understanding. And I have to tell you, in my ecumenical work, we as Catholics need to offer it to our other Christian friends who are so disillusioned and discouraged. Think about it. If we live in a pre-Christian West that doesn't accept the authority of the Bible, it's awfully hard to quote the Bible and expect anyone to listen to your argument. In classical Christianity, in the undivided church of the first thousand years, we had a clear understanding of the natural moral law. Paul talks about it in his letter to the Romans. But our Christian friends and many of the communities that came out of the Protestant Reformation don't have such an understanding. We need to offer it to them and understand it ourselves. We need to be able to make the arguments to defend the truth about the dignity of every human person from conception throughout all of life to natural death from a natural moral law perspective. We need to be able to contend for the truth about marriage as between one man and one woman, intended for life, open to life, formative of family, from a natural moral law perspective. We need to be able to speak about religious freedom as a fundamental human right from a natural moral law perspective. Catholics are the ones who must do this. And not just the intellectuals, not just the closed elitist circles that so often I associate, unfortunately, with coming up here. But normal, regular people <laughs> need to be able to make those arguments and bring them into the public square. What I've tried to do tonight is too much, and it was to deal with the connection between freedom and truth and authentic liberty. I began by once again underscoring the clear teaching of the New Testament and the unbroken teaching of the church that there is an inseparable connection between freedom and truth. And that has implications in the moral life. I tried to take a look at what happened to the West, suggesting to you that first of all, we need to realize the West is in trouble, but not so we can become depressed and withdraw from the culture, rather so we can discover once again what it means to be missionaries and offer the remedy to the culture. And then finally, I suggested that within the beauty of our own Catholic teaching, we have the resources that we can bring to transform this age with the light of the gospel. It's a tall order, but it's exactly what we're invited to be a part of. You know, Jesus said in the gospel that to those to whom much is given, much more will be required. As a Catholic Christian, a revert to the church, I believe, as the council said, the fullness of truth subsists within the Catholic Church. But that should not make us haughty. It should make us humble. And it gives us the highest obligation. Father Richard John Newhouse once wrote a book called The Catholic Moment. Maybe some of you remember that. It was written in the last millennium. 
I believe this is a Catholic century and a Catholic millennium. That the Catholic Church, just when people are counting her down and out, is once again experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to help usher in a new missionary age. And every single man and woman in this room is invited to be a part of it. Let us say yes to the Lord's invitation. Let us reject sin. Let us turn to him and find the freedom that is ours as sons and daughters of God. And then let us take our place in this new missionary age, bringing the truth of freedom found in the fullness of the gospel into an age waiting to be born again. God bless you all, and thank you for having me with you, and thank you for your fidelity. When you were talking about uh, the, the parable of the rich man, uh, the next paragraph in the catechism uh, after where you were talking about was really talking about um, freedom. It was 1734. It says, freedom makes man responsible for his acts to the extent that they are voluntary. And then it goes on to talk about the passions and stuff like that. I didn't quite understand it, but it looked to me like there was a lot more between what you, uh, what you talked about. Uh, and I just don't know if you, if you could just fill it in a little bit. Oh, there is. That whole section needs to be studied. It's beautiful. Uh, that whole section on man's freedom and how our freedom makes us responsible for our own choices. And in fact, we can become culpable based upon uh, the choices we make. Um, you need to read the entire section. I, I, Article 3, man's freedom, 1731, all the way through to freedom in the economy of salvation. And then it goes right into Article 4, the morality of human acts. This entire section of the Catechism is a short course in Catholic moral teaching. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. And I just skipped through and gave a few quotes. I would suggest that anyone who wants to do a study on Catholic moral theology, and by the way, uh, this is an area of Catholic thought that is really in a wonderful, wonderful stage of renewal. One of the great moral teachers of our age is a Dominican, Cerveis Pinkers. I brought a book of his. Um, most people use the tome, Sources of Christian Ethics. I brought a short one because I think it's a very, very good one. It's called Morality, the Catholic View by Cerveis Pinkers. He was a Dominican. And the Catechism and Pinkers' thought are very much in consonant with one another. And the, the, this Catechism is beautiful in terms of understanding the moral life. I would suggest that people just go to that section and study it. Um, it goes into all kinds of implications of man's freedom and what happens as a result of our choice. Uh, Deacon, uh, coming in online from Jared McFarland, he says, I have a friend who is possibly considering uh, converting the Catholic Church, but he is very uh, into the Calvinist John Piper. Is it Piper? What are a good biblical passage or passages or arguments for free will? That's a. And by the way, Joseph Pieper is another one that I highly <laughs> recommend. <laughs> yeah, the whole, this is this. That's a huge other talk. Huge it one. really, yeah. really is. Um, you know, I use some of the great passages in terms of freedom. Um, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Uh, Paul's instructions to the Romans. Um, I think that the whole issue of John Calvin and post-Calvin uh, thought in that particular stream of the Protestant Reformation, you know, it's, it's always been very intriguing to me that some of the great Catholic apologists of our age are former Calvinists, and are some of the greatest proponents of freedom. Look at uh, Peter Kraft, right? I think Scott Hahn was a Presbyterian. Um, you know, I don't really want to get much more into that. Uh, it, it clearly is a very big difference between Catholic thought on human freedom and some versions of Calvinism. Now, on the positive side of that Reformed tradition, they have a real social consciousness. They have a real sense of our obligation to be in the public order. Uh, and we collaborate a lot on um, the concept of justice and good governance and all of that. But when it comes down to the human person and freedom 
And when it comes down to the effects of sin, major, major differences. You know, to be overly simplistic, you know, the Catholic, and I believe the classical vision, is that sin wounded us. It fractured our freedom, I said tonight. Uh, it, it, it marred us. We don't stand for the notion that we are now totally depraved. We still have that inclination to what is good and what is true and what is beautiful within us. And it is grace that helps us to progress in freedom. Now, we're not Pelagian. We don't think we can save ourselves. But at the same time, we don't believe that we're totally depraved. We believe that we are wounded by sin, marred by sin, and there still is, in Roman, the, you know, Roman terminology, concupiscence that seems to draw us back to sin. But grace is even greater. So that's another difference. There are major differences. That's why in terms of ecumenism, and I do a lot of work with our evangelical Protestant friends on religious liberty and pro-life and religious uh, and, and family and marriage issues and the like. But I think we have to also have a, a right approach to an authentic ecumenism, which would be another whole talk. There are major distinctives in our, all of our ologies, our anthropology, the nature of the human person, our soteriology, our eschatology, our missiology, our ecclesiology. But we can concentrate on the highest common denominator which brings us together, and that is Jesus Christ and the centrality of Jesus Christ. And we have to have a big-hearted ecumenism in our relationship with them as well, realizing that we can learn from them too. So I would suggest that your friend go to some sources from former Calvinists who treat these subjects quite well, like Peter Kraft, like Scott Hahn, and begin to read. But then also to remember that the greatest asset in authentic Christian relationships with Christians who are not in full communion is charity of heart. We need to respect one another and realize that we can also learn from one another. I have a uh, political culture question bearing on maybe your experience in international or, or the legal aspects. Some of us are concerned that the political culture in this political culture, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Do you have any observations or comparisons with the Canadian experience and where their law is going in terms of Christian uh, beliefs and how that is acting out in various human rights councils, et cetera, and where it may go in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, we're catching up with the Canadian experience. We really are. And um, that's a sad thing, and our Canadian Christian friends will tell us that. And the growing soft persecution in Canada, we're now catching up with that too. And I use that term carefully. Remember, we're living in an age of martyrs, but we're not shedding our blood. We have brethren in North Africa and Middle East who are shedding their blood. And that's a powerful, powerful incentive for us to not only pray for them, uh, but to get on our knees. We are, however, suffering the soft persecution that comes with a culture that has completely rejected God in any sense of a natural moral law. Uh, and it is getting worse, but it will get better. What it's going to take, however, are courageous, well-formed Christians who are willing to get into the rough and tumble. Now, I talk a lot about this and write a lot about this, whether it's writing for the stream or for Catholic News Agency or Catholic Online. Um, we need to be clear as Catholic Christians on some very important issues, like, for example, the growing threat to religious liberty in this country. We have to do everything we can. You know, it's kind of like the imagery of, this, of the book of Nehemiah, the sword and the trowel. You had people at the wall with the sword who were fighting off the bad guys. But then you had people on the wall with the trowel and who were praying and worshiping and interceding. We need all of that going on at once. Court battles are not going to stop the wall from falling down, but they will keep the bad guys from making any further advances. That's why I think it's very important, and I'm very grateful that since the days when I was doing stuff like the ACLJ in the last millennium, we now have dozens of public interest legal groups doing very good work. From the Beckett Fund, I'm special counsel to the Liberty Council. There's a lot of good work going on. The same is true in terms of political participation. We need morally coherent candidates to run for public office, and if they don't exist, we need to become them. Morally coherent. That means we recognize that what we believe on the truth of the dignity of every human life cannot be separated out from our political positions. Uh, and we need to have people who are willing to defend the truth about marriage as between one man and one woman. But we're going to need some thick skin as well, um, because 
we see the trends and we see that Canada is no longer farther down the road. We have, however, I think, and this is the final thing I say, in our own polity, our own political structures, some assets that perhaps they don't have. Um, separation of powers, uh, the whole way in which the American experiment was set up. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but um, uh, that's the best I can do for right now. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.